I'm Nicole Lyons with DKB Household, and I'm here today with my favorite chef, Chef Matt Zagorski. Where are we today, Matt? Today, we're in Libertyville, Illinois, in a store called The Joyful Gourmet. Now, The Joyful Gourmet is a little over a year old, and they have everything you need for your kitchen. They really got the kitchen essentials covered. They also have great tabletop offerings, an awesome cooking school, and to bring the foot traffic in that walks past their doors, they actually have a wine bar that's open during business hours. They're super creative here, and we're really grateful to uh, be able to use our kitchen today. You had me at wine bar, Matt. Is it wine o'clock yet? It's not, but it will be once we're done filming. Yeah, it's a, sure. it's a little early for that, <laughs> for sure. We gotta get our work done first. Right, right. And speaking of work, today's format is gonna be a little different than our previous ones. Sure, we're gonna talk about new product. Yep. We're gonna have great recipes, but we're also gonna take a little step back and talk about the things that are most sellable, those really great attributes about Cole and Mason that we hope that you're sharing with your customer base. You know, I think one of the most impressive things about Cole and Mason, or at least when I'm talking to my customer base, the one point that seems to really resonate with them is the fact that we are over 100 years old. I mean, if, when you think of 100-year-old companies here in the U.S., yep. you're talking about Buick and Ford and Colgate and Jim Beam and DuPont, companies that are so iconic that they're actually part of our culture here. Household names. Household names. Absolutely. You can't say enough, I think, about the fact that we are that old and that we've survived that long, especially during the recent economy and everything. Yep. A lot it's of impressive. companies didn't even make that. And as a 100-year-old company, we blew right through it. And we have some good accolades to go with that. Not only are we, we sure saying do. we're old, we make a great product, but who likes us out there? Remember Cooks Illustrated? That yes. was a great article. A couple of years ago, Cooks Illustrated did their ranking of mills, and they didn't say we were their favorite mill. They didn't say we were a good mill. Yep. We were the perfect pepper mill. And they've repeated that accolade several times. They think we have a great product. Right, right. Yeah, but we got it from someone who has got those credentials, like Cooks Illustrated. And if I recall, they really liked our uh, Derwent mill. That's the one that they tested, and right. I liked it really because it had a lot of output per turn. You could definitely see the difference in the grind when you set the adjustment. It was right. markedly different, and it was just really consistent, definitely easy to adjust, and lots of output. There's really something for everybody in the Coleman Mason assortment. So. Yeah. So those are just some ideas to remember as you're talking to your customers about Coleman Mason. There's a terrific heritage here, great mechanics, a great mechanism, beautiful traditional designs that are still relevant. It's a great brand, and I'm really proud to represent it. Yep. Well, now let's get moving on and we're going to talk to you about some specific products and let's get to our recipes. Sounds like fun. For sure. One of the things we get asked a lot when selling Cole and the Mason mills is what makes the mechanism great and why is this product better than another competitive mill that you might see out in the marketplace? Believe it or not, aesthetics is a part of it. That's the part that gets you to buy the mill and have it on your counter and display it and be proud of it. But the, the mechanisms or the innards of the mill are probably more important because that's where the flavor is actually coming from. So I want to talk about uh, the mills by grouping them by category. So the majority of the Cole and Mason lineup is going to fall into either a precision mechanism or a gourmet precision mechanism. So we're gonna talk through what that precision mechanism entails for both salt and pepper, and then I'll differentiate what is the difference there when you move into the gourmet precision styles. It's really not too complicated, so don't get too caught up in the lingo. And then I'm also gonna talk a bit about uh, how to refill, because we get that question a lot. And then I'm gonna bring Matt in, our favorite chef Matt in, to do a little blind taste test with a competitive mill versus ours. And hopefully he gets the right answer because of course the right answer is the Cole and Mason mill is better tasting pepper, but we're gonna put Matt to the test on that. So to go back to where we started, let's talk through the precision mechanisms. So I have here um, two different pepper mills and two different salt mills, okay? These happen to be the Marlowe and our uh, capstan, our wood capstans. And what I'm gonna show you is that on the pepper mill, you'll notice that you see metal down here on the inside of this black collar. And on the salt mill, you see white. This one, this mechanism for pepper is made of a hardened carbon steel. And on the salt, this guy is made of a very sharp diamond cut ceramic. That helps get very precise salt 
grind, but you can't have a steel mechanism for salt because salt is very corrosive. We all know if you leave things out in salty air, salty weather, things near the beach, they corrode and they don't last. So salt mills should not have a steel mechanism. Okay, so that's just kind of a very basic differentiation then between our pepper mills and our salt mills. We do use a unique mechanism for both. And on the pepper mills, you have that, um, again, this is the precision mechanism, and it's a two-stage mechanism that is inside here. You can't see that. But what that does is it allows the peppercorn to funnel down into the mechanism. First, it cracks the peppercorn. The black peppercorns are really hard. If you try to break one with your fingers, you'll notice how hard they are. So it's, first of all, it cracks that, and then it strips it. And what that does, by cracking it first and then stripping it, it's not crushing it, it's stripping away at it, and that releases the oil. And the oil is where the great flavor is in the pepper, which is what you want. You're not just putting it on top of your food for decoration. You want it to really taste good. So that's what's happening in that two-stage precision mechanism. So what's different when you move into the gourmet precision mechanisms is same thing, salt versus pepper, case-hardened steel, or a diamond-cut ceramic. So it's got its little protector on here that we put on there whenever we ship them so the salt and pepper don't go everywhere. So you can see that case hardened steel, again, the diamond cut ceramic. And with gourmet precision as opposed to the regular precision, you are adjusting your grind from coarse to fine right down here on the front collar. So you just turn the collar where the brand logo is and you get coarse to fine. Now, if we move back to precision, you don't have that collar. So you're wondering, how do you adjust that? These guys are adjusted down here on the bottom with a little dial, again, that has markings. A small dot is fine, large dot is coarse, and you just twist that, okay? Very simply, just twist that around to go from fine to coarse. So when you go to the gourmet precision, the difference is how you adjust the grind. And these guys are broken out in the catalog so you can see the difference between which ones have that collar to adjust and gourmet and which ones do not. The grinding mechanism otherwise is the same. It's that precision mechanism. You're still gonna get that great release of oil and that wonderful flavor. So we alluded to the fact that Cooks Illustrated loves our Derwent Mill and it's been continually rated as their perfect mill and the top choice. One of the reasons for that is the high output as we talked about, and also the fact that when you adjust it, you get a marked difference between coarse and fine. I've taken mills before, competitive products, and I've set them in different settings a lot of times the, the grind looks almost the same and you can't really tell that you've adjusted it. I like ours because you really get a difference. So we'll start off, I'll show you grinding on the coarsest of the course. And I'll just show you, we won't go through all six, I'll show you three different ones. So here is your extra coarse grind. This is something that you're gonna use um, when you really wanna be able to see the, pe the pepper and have more of that bold pepper taste. Okay, so you can see how nice and coarse that is. And you can see with just a few turns, how much pepper I actually got out of the mill. Then let's move over somewhere here in the middle. We'll start about here, I think looks good. Okay, and we'll see what you get output wise here. You can see I'm getting way less of those larger chunks of pepper. It's pretty even, I'd call that a medium grind, which since I have it set in the middle is exactly what I was looking for, right? And then if you want super, super fine, maybe you're doing a soup or something where you don't wanna see the pepper, but you definitely need the flavor, We'll come all the way over here to the finest grind on this gourmet precision mill, and you'll see, wow, that all of a sudden looks a lot finer than what I had here in the middle. So you can see the differences between super fine, kind of the medium grind, and then your coarsest of grind using the Derwent, in this case, which has the gourmet precision mechanism. You'll get similar results when you're using the regular precision mechanism. It's just you're adjusting it using the dial, so it's not quite as easy to pinpoint where you are with fine, medium, and coarse, but you're still gonna get the different outputs like you see here. So that is definitely one of the big selling points of the Colin Mason Mills is the mechanism, which cracks and then strips the peppercorn. You get such a nice, really, really strong pepper aroma. If you've ever gone to a restaurant or taken an old pepper shaker that you might've had in your house, pulled it out, shaking it on your food. A lot of times it doesn't smell like anything. So you're really putting it on more for decoration than you are for taste. So that mechanism is really important to release the oils and give you the best tasting food as well as a really consistent and nice output. Matt is gonna help us today perform a little taste test that we like to do to show the difference in the flavor 
of grinding pepper with one of our precision mechanisms versus a competitive mill, which will remain nameless. So I'm going to, Matt's not looking, I'm going to take and on half of this tray where the four pieces are, I'm going to take and put the competitive pepper mill grind. On the other side, I'm going to put the coal and mason grind. And the purpose of this is so that you can smell and taste the difference in the pepper. And we're going to see if Matt votes the competitive mill or the coal and mason mill as his top choice for giving the best flavor. We've already talked about the output, what it looks like. Now we're going to try to cover the flavor aspect. So this mill will remain nameless. It's got an, a top adjustment grind. So I'm going to get it kind of somewhere in the middle. Okay. Not super fine, not super coarse. We don't want to choke Matt on large peppercorns and we're just going to go, whoops, that's a little coarse. It's hard to adjust, but I'm trying to get it a little bit finer. All right, so I said those four, we're gonna have the competitive pepper on there. And then we are going to take uh, one of our gourmet precision mechanisms. And I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna try to get it somewhat equal to what that is. So I'm gonna put it about here on the, about the fourth setting over. And we're gonna do this guy real quick. Oops, that's a little bit finer. Okay. I want to choke him, but we want to make sure there's enough so he can taste it. Okay, so Matt was not watching what I just did. He's going to come on over here, and we are going to let him taste both and see if he notices a difference in smell and flavor. Hi, Nicole. So, Matt, you get to be the guinea pig today. Aren't you lucky? Awesome. Okay, so you can try either side first, but I want you to try one from that side and one from that side. You know, right away, I'm smelling a lot of pepper. You want to see if you can tell the difference in the smell yeah. between the two? Okay, I can smell a lot of pepper on that, and okay. then this is the other side. Yeah, not nearly as much. And to be fair, while Matt is eating and, and thinking through this with his sensory smell and taste, I put the same peppercorns from the same jar in both mills today, so there's no trickery with using different peppercorns here. That had a little pepper flavor to it, okay. but not really that much. Okay. Wow. Um, there's significantly more pepper flavor on this half. Whichever one was this half, significantly more flavor. Well, that half was our Cook's Illustrated favorite mill, the Derwent. Awesome. So, which is again, the gourmet precision mechanism, which is between that and our precision mechanism in the majority of the product line. So you're really getting, you can tell by the smell, wow. you can yeah. tell by the flavor. It's a dramatic It difference. tastes totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a simple, great test to do with a plain cracker. We use water crackers because they're readily available and there's no taste to them. And cream cheese, plain cream cheese, don't get the fancy stuff. And do that taste difference. Hopefully you'll do it at least at home. And maybe it's something that you want to talk about and share with your customers as well. Uh, if you're going to take the time to pepper food, it better have some flavor, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So there is a benefit, not only in appearance with using a cold and mason mill, but because of the mechanism that's there and the way it strips the peppercorn after it cracks it, that you get the flavor output out of it. For sure. Super. When people talk about Colin Mason, the term that often comes up is seasoning experts. Now seasoning to most people means salt and pepper. In this segment, we're going to talk about the five most common peppercorns and some of their differences. Now first, don't worry about taking notes. Again, we're going to send you a handout after the viewing of this. Here are the five most common kind of peppercorns. We have black, white, green. These are red peppercorns. And finally, Szechuan. Let's start our story by talking about black. Black peppercorns are the peppercorns most people are familiar with. If you've ever had pre-ground pepper in the shaker, that's usually black peppercorns. The flavor for this, I think we're all familiar with. It can be kind of smoky, it can be kind of citrusy, woodsy. It adds a lot of heat and complexity to a dish. I think the most interesting thing about black peppercorns is that when you eat them, they actually activate the saliva glands in your mouth and make you produce more saliva. Now, I know this might sound kind of gross, but it's important to your ability to taste. If we didn't have saliva, we wouldn't eat, be able to taste food. So, not only do black peppercorns 
make our food taste better, they help us taste our food better. I think that's really cool. Now, black peppercorns can be used for a variety of things, for meats, for vegetables, for fish, for soups. Truly a universal uh, peppercorn and the most common one. Now, the next peppercorn we're going to talk about is the white. White peppercorns are actually fully mature, ripened black peppercorns. They take these and then they soak them in water and then they allow them to ferment. And after they're done with that, they take the outer husk off, leave them out the sun to dry. I think it's this reason that these are the angriest of all the peppercorns. These are really aggressive. When I eat a white peppercorn, the whole front of my mouth gets hot and the whole front of my tongue gets hot. And I think it's because the peppercorn at the end of the day is drowned, stripped, and then left out to dry. That would make anybody angry, right? As far as flavor, these have what's called a funkiness to them. Now, those of us with a little gray hair, funky means one thing, but in a culinary sense, funky you often associate with things like cheese and mushrooms. It's a very pleasant earthiness. These are most commonly used in things that take advantage of their color. They're often used in mashed potatoes and white cream sauces. Over here, we have green peppercorns. These are actually unripe black peppercorns. Because they're not fully ripened, they have a much uh, softer taste to them. They're actually very, very floral. Now, when I say floral, a lot of people think of flowers. To me, this tastes like the forest. I think of pine and juniper notes. It's really, really a great, great peppercorn. It's not a lot of heat, but you will feel it on the outside of your tongue. Green peppercorns are often used to season more delicate foods. So uh, things like stuffings and soups are common application for green peppercorns. These over here are red peppercorns. And these are, to be honest, the most dishonest of all the peppercorns because these are not actually peppercorns at all. These are a berry from a Chinese tree called the prickly ash. In terms of flavor, it's actually a very, very light flavor, very citrusy, very lemony, super pleasant. One of the big characteristics of red peppercorns is that activating your uh, saliva glands. This is known to make you salivate, which as we talked about over here, is something that helps you taste your food better. Common applications for this are actually popcorn. People use them in Bloody Marys and with things like sweet potatoes. The last peppercorn we're going to talk about is this one, which is the Szechuan. And to be honest, it's also a big liar because these aren't peppercorns at all. These are berries from an evergreen tree. The flavor on these is very floral. Now remember we talked with the green ones, floral kind of reminded me of a forest. This is very, very floral. Like think of flowers. Because of that, it's often used with things like fruits and cheeses and mild custard like desserts. I gotta tell you, to get ready for this, I was trying some of these. These actually have a strange numbing effect in your mouth. They will actually make the front of your tongue and your lips numb if you chew on them for long enough. So there you go. There are the five most common kinds of peppercorns. It's important for you to know that all these peppercorns, whether in a mix or on their own, are available through Colin Mason. So thanks for your attention. Congratulations, you know all about pepper. So let's start talking about our salts. Here we have the four most common salts. Here is iodized or table salt. This is kosher salt. Over here, this is pink Himalayan salt. And finally, sea salt. It's important for you to remember that these two, pink Himalayan and sea salt, are available through Colin Mason. Now let's start our story over here. This is iodized or table salt. Now, those of us with a little gray hair know that the reason this is called table salt is that this is what sat in the shaker in the middle of our kitchen table while we were growing up. The things differentiate salts is 
where it's from, how it's made, and if there's anything added to it. In terms of being processed, iodized or table salt is by far the most processed salt of all the salts here. It's pounded, it's crushed, it's bleached. All sorts of things happen to it to get it to look like this. Added to iodized salt is iodine. To tell that story, we go back to the 1920s. Back then, people were suffering from hyperthyroidism as a result of a lack of iodine in their diet. So to get iodine, an important and essential human min uh, mineral for humans, the salt company said, we can help out. They began putting iodine in the salt. Within a few years, hyperthyroidism, because of a lack of iodine, was completely eradicated. Now, you cannot taste the iodine in table salt, but if you've ever had something that was really salty and you felt like a burn in the back of your throat, that would be the iodine. Now, as far as uses, table salt is used exclusively in baking. Recipes, unless they call for it, are not meant for any other salts. The other thing we use table salt for is to make our food salty. When you think of salty french fries or potato chips, they're salty because this is the kind of salt they use. The next salt we're going to talk about is kosher salt. Kosher salt is the same as iodized salt, except it's not as crushed to get to this fine powder as table salt. And there's nothing added to it. There's no iodine added to kosher salt. Because of that, people feel that kosher salt has a very clean and pure salt taste. One of the ways we use this is to season our food during the cooking process. Because these crystals are so large, they're very easy to sprinkle into our food to season before and during cooking. Now this over here is Himalayan salt. And just like the name would suggest, it comes from Pakistan. There's huge salt mines there. They break off the salt, crush it down, stick it in a bottle, and send it out to us. This is actually one of the most pure forms of salt there is. And because of that, a lot of people feel there's a lot of health benefits to using Himalayan salt. This has been tied to controlling blood pressure, controlling your blood sugar, a whole host of health benefits are associated with Himalayan pink salt. If you've ever been to someone's house and you see a block of it sitting on a table, that's because Himalayan salt will purify the air around it. How much health benefits are actually tied to pink Himalayan salt, I can't say, but it is important to know that a lot of people feel that way. One of the best ways to use pink Himalayan salt is as a finishing salt. It keeps its texture really, really long and it has a very clean taste to it. So let's say you're bringing some brownies to a potluck or you're going to a holiday event. You would use this as a finishing salt to put it right on top. It'll give it a nice color and it'll keep its texture for a long time and it won't melt into the chocolate. The last salt we're gonna talk about is sea salt. And as the name implies, it comes from the sea. People who make sea salt have these things called tidal pools. And what they do is they open a big gate, let the tide come in, close the gate, and wait for that water that they let in to evaporate. Once it does, the residue that's left, they scrape up, and that's sea salt. Because it comes from the sea, sea salt has a lot of minerals to it. Because of that, people feel that sea salt is much healthier than, let's say, kosher salt. Because of the mineral makeup of it, sea salt also has a different taste than kosher salt. There are some people whose palates are so good, they can actually tell the difference between some of these sea salts. One of the most fun things about sea salt, at least to me, is that it comes in a whole host of colors. If you go to Hawaii, you get red sea salt. There's black sea salts, brown. If you go to France, there's a gray sea salt called fleur de sal. All these are great to use as a finishing uh, salt or garnish to something that you're using or getting ready to serve. So there you go. Those are the four most common salts. Congratulations, you're now a salt expert.
I'm here today to share with you the beautiful new packaging for our Cole & Mason product lineup. We, uh, you probably have seen a lot of this rolling into retail stores over the last many months, but now everything is shipping out of the warehouse in the new packaging, which we're super excited about. The brand, as you know, is over 100 years old, and we thought a packaging refresh made a lot of sense so that the pack looks as premium as the product inside. So one of the things that not everybody is aware of, but Cole & Mason products are predominantly named after locations in the UK. So you'll see things like the Marlowe, the Richmond, the Derwent that you know so well. Those are all locations in the UK. There's a couple of exceptions to that, but everything pretty much that has a name name is named after a city or location in the UK. So uh, anything with a swing tag, like the Lincoln here, is going to have that new updated tag to match as well. That used to be red, now it matches all the rest of the packaging. The Gourmet, uh, Precision Gourmet Mills are still going to be in the nice magnetic closure pack, which I think is really great because when you're gifting this, it's nice to have something that can be open and closed and still look very premium as well as in the store. People can take it out, look at it, test it, and still get it back together and have it be a nice presentation, great for wrapping, and uh, a super nice just overall look to the line. So we hope that you'll agree that the line looks extremely stellar in its new black classy packaging with a little more color and the product names front and center. I'm really excited to share with you a Cole & Mason sales tool that we use in the home office all the time. I've used this with all my major accounts with great success. And I can't imagine a reason that it won't work well with the independents too. It is called the assortment grid. And rather than try to explain it to you, why don't we show it to you? So on the screen right now, you should be looking at a four by four table. What we're gonna do with the columns is we're gonna assign each column a dollar value. The first one is gonna be below 30, then we're going to do 30 to 50, and finally, 50 and above. Then we're going to name the rows. We're going to name the rows based on the materials most commonly used to manufacture mills. So we're looking at metal, wood, and acrylic. Now to use this, go to your appointment like you normally would, show up a couple minutes early, and start to fill it out according to your customer's assortment. Now I did this with a make-believe customer, and you can see what it looks like right now. So based on the grid, you can see that for metal mills, they have something for 30 and below, 30 to 50, but they're missing the 50 and above. For wood, they have 30 and below, 50 and above, but they're missing something in the 30 to 50 range. And they have a great offering for acrylic. Now hopefully, you've already figured out that the opportunities exist where the cells are left blank. For the 50 and above, this is a great opportunity to show them the Derwin, our flagship mill. It sells great everywhere. As for the wood, this would be a time to bring in the Marlowe or our basic wood set. That's a perfect fit for this. Now, you can use this grid in a variety of different ways. So let's say, instead of talking about materials, you want to talk about functionality. So instead of saying metal, wood, and acrylic, maybe you want to say grinder, shaker, and electrics. Or you can do it by fashion. So maybe you want to put traditional, modern, farmhouse. Use your creativity and use this tool to find those new opportunities. I really like using this tool because it takes our sales meeting to a consultative position. We're sharing with our customer not only great product, but we're sharing with them some education. I hope you use this tool and it brings you as much success as it has me. I'm really excited to show you this next recipe. This next recipe is butternut squash soup. With this, we're gonna take everything we've been talking about, Cole and Mason, the difference between peppers, the difference in our mills and how to use the grind settings, and it's gonna pull it all together. You don't have to worry about writing down this recipe. We have it for you and we're gonna send it out 
after the premiere of our video. Now, to get started, I have Nicole here helping me out. The first thing you need to do to make butternut squash soup is get a big, heavy bottom pot, put it on a medium-high heat, put two tablespoons of butter in there. Once that butter melts, we're going to add a medium onion, we're going to cut it up, and we're going to let that saute for about five or six minutes. After about five minutes, though, you're going to take a clove of garlic, you're going to put it in there as well. We're going to let all these things saute. So Nicole's just started that process, and we're going to let her finish. While she's doing that, let's talk about the butternut squash. Now this is a butternut squash. I live here in Chicago, and I can find these probably 10 months out of the year. To process this, we're going to first peel it. Now this is a great time to use your wide peeler, which I have right here. I've already started peeling this, so now I'm just going to finish peeling this butternut squash. This wide peeler makes a really fast job of this. Now, I need to take the top and the bottom off this, so I'm going to take a really sharp knife and cut the top off and cut the bottom off. Now, I'm going to take this and we're going to cut it in half. And you're going to see, just like a pumpkin, it has all these seeds and all these guts down here, and you don't need it. So just like a pumpkin, we're going to take a spoon and we're going to clear this out and just throw it right in the garbage. And we'll do that with both halves. Now, to get this ready for soup, we have to cut this into smaller pieces. You're looking to cut this in pieces that are about one by one. Now, I've already done that, and they're right here. So let's check in with Nicole for the next step. How are we doing, Nicole? We're doing good. I haven't burnt anything yet. Excellent. It's really good when, uh, to remember when you're doing this soup, if you can avoid getting color on the onions, that's even better. It's not the end of the world if you do, but the soup looks a little bit better in the end if you don't. So now, I'm gonna take my butternut squash, these are one by one cut pieces, and I'm gonna add it to the pot that Nicole's been cooking the onions in. And now that we have the butternut squash in there, we're gonna add six cups of chicken stock, which I have right here. Now that we've added the stock, we want to bring the whole soup up to a boil, and then we're going to turn it down to a simmer. When soup simmers, that means just little bubbles are going to break the surface of it. We want to do this for about 20 minutes. The reason we're doing it for 20 minutes is we want to have our butternut squash pieces become fork tender. That means that when we take them out, we put a fork in it, the fork goes right through the piece of butternut squash. So Nicole, would you turn that up? Yep, just did. I think we're looking good on simmer. Great. Now, we've already made a pot of this. And we've already brought it to a simmer. It's been cooking for 20 minutes. Let's make sure that the butternut squash is fork tender. So I'm going to grab a spoon. Thank you. Put a piece right here. Grab a piece. We're going to make sure it's fork tender. So let's check that. Boom. The fork goes right through. The soup is ready to puree. Now, Nicole, I have here an immersion blender. Could you process this for us? I have us? used one before. I would be Excellent. happy to. Absolutely, thank you. Our goal here is to puree the soup to make it super smooth. Now that Nicole is done pureeing the soup, we're going to season it. First, we're going to add about half a teaspoon of ground nutmeg. We're going to use our ad hoc nutmeg mill for that. And then, because we're seasoning experts, which we know means salt and pepper, we're going to add some salt. That should be about right. And now, we're going to add pepper. Because this is a really nice velvety soup, we want to set our uh, 
uh, Derwent Mill to the lowest setting we can. This is a very easy, very drinkable soup. You don't want your guests, when they're eating this, to get stuck on a big old honking piece of peppercorn and chew it. So we're going to use a very, very fine setting on this. We've all done that before. You take a bite of super salad and all you get is that pepper on the back of your throat and then you're coughing. It's not, it's not pretty. And then when I have my brother-in-law come over. Oh yes, your favorite brother-in-law. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. spitting up in lawsuits it's, and everything. It's, it's just, it's insane. It's bad. You either increase the insurance policy, don't invite him over the next time, or stop using the extra coarse pepper. Absolutely. So you can see here, because the grate on the pepper was so fine, it virtually disappears in the soup. I can't wait to taste this. Would you mind? I'd like to try it right I now. I would love to. Excellent. I would love to. So I have a bowl right here. It's such a beautiful color. Isn't too. it great? It's perfect for this time of That's year. That's for you. Do I get a garnish? Yep. One oh, second. I like a garnish. Everything has to Here's happen. my bowl. Yum. Now to garnish this soup, I love to use fresh sage. Now this is what fresh sage looks like. You can find it in almost any grocery store. For garnish, I like to give it a real fine cut and then garnish it right there in the bowl. Beautiful. This should taste just like fall. So let's make sure that I did a good job with it, let's right? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm ready. Just the color makes me think I'm ready for fall already. Mmm. Mmm. That is so fall-like. Delicious and what an easy soup to make. Yeah. I love it. It really is. I love that. I love that little hint of sage in there. Very mm. nice. With the holidays coming up, we're all thinking of Thanksgiving, Christmas. I hope you'll give this a try and it brings warm, happy memories to you and your family. I'm here with our new Colin Mason salt and pepper refill sets. We've got two different ones available. And I think they're a great addition to any gift that you would give of a Colin Mason mill or just for refilling your own mills at home. So the two different ones are gonna be the luxury salt and pepper set, which is here. That's gonna be simply your Himalayan pink salt and then also a nice blend of gourmet peppercorns, the red, the white, the green, and the black. Both really, really nice basics for everyday cooking. So in the aromatic salt and pepper set, We've got a Szechuan peppercorn and then also a chili salt, which consists of chili flakes and also your uh, sea salt. Really, really interesting combination, all right? We're gonna look at those a little bit closer. So you can see the really, really attractive glass jars that you get here. Nice heavyweight with the uh, beautiful metal tops, just really an attractive set, which is important obviously for gifting. And your Szechuan peppercorns, these are gonna be a really florally and um, real pungent uh, type of a peppercorn. You can see they look very different than your normal peppercorns. And we'll show you the Stadhampton Mill here that will be a perfect item for grinding these guys. We also have your sea salt mixed with your chili flakes here. And that is just a really nice combination if you want to add a little bit of spice and you need the salt as well. That would be great for rimming a cocktail glass or for making a spicy Asian dish. Super, super fun new flavors that we want to share with you from Cole and Mason. One of the best parts of Matt's and my jobs is coming up with really fun and new ways to use our tools. Of course, 
We also love working with our sales reps. That's one of our favorite things. But second to that, we'll say it's coming up with creative uses for the products that we have. Products are great. They look nice in their packaging, but let's face it, people need a reason to buy these products. So one of my tasks was to come up with something fun and festive for the holiday season, which is rapidly approaching. And I thought what better way to do that than come up with a cocktail that you can use to welcome friends into your home, serve to your friends and neighbors, and just something that's really festive. So what I've come up with is a cranberry margarita. And we're gonna do it in a martini glass. You could certainly use any type of glass you have or like, depending on if you're gonna use ice or not. And we're gonna feature the Stadhampton Chili and Spice Mill, which is a great item that you've seen used. And then we're using the chili salt. So here's a great way to use two of our new products with our uh, spice refill and also our Stadhampton Mill. So I've gone ahead and I have ground quite a bit of this chili salt, very fine, because you don't wanna have too big of pieces of chili flakes on the rim of the glass. You don't want people to choke as they're uh, enjoying their lovely cocktail. So I've got a plate full of that ready to go. And we'll go ahead and we will rim the glass. So you're gonna take a little bit of lime juice around the rim of your glasses. Basically, you're just trying to wet the rim so the chili salt will adhere. So I cut that little notch in there. We're just gonna go around it. All right, get those ready to go. So you wanna have the glasses prepared ahead of time and then we'll mix up the cocktail, which is super fast and super pretty, okay? So we've got the, the moisture on there so we can get our nice chili salt to stick and then we're just gonna go around. And you could do this in a bowl if you have a bowl that's the right size. These happen to be pretty uh, broad rimmed glasses. So I thought a plate might do a little bit better job here today. And you don't need a ton. And if you like coarse, go coarse. I just figured with the chili salt, and the uh, chilies in there for spice. We don't want to get it too, too heavy. And this is something, if you've got guests coming over, you could do this ahead of time. You don't have to stand there and do this while you've got company. Just have your glasses sitting off to the side, ready to go. Okay. Just a little is all you need. Okay, so then we're going to take another fun uh, blast from the past product, as I like to call it. And that's going to be our quick blend shaker. And we're going to use this for our cocktail shaker today. So what I've got in here is ice. Nothing fancier than ice. Usually you use crushed ice, but if you don't have it, you can use whole ice. And then we're going to put our ingredients in. So you can do this a couple different ways. You can use uh, store-bought cranberry juice, preferably the 100% cranberry juice without the sugars and the sweeteners in it. So look for something that says pure cranberry juice, no cocktail. You can use the cocktail and just back off on the simple syrup, but I really like it to be super, super tart and love that really bold flavor of the um, pure cranberry juice. So let's go ahead and get that going. And I'm making a double batch. So if you're following the recipe that uh, we're gonna send out to everyone, I'm doing a double batch. So I'm gonna do three ounces of the cranberry juice. My jigger here happens to be an ounce and a half. So we'll just do two of those. And then we're also gonna do uh, three ounces on the tequila. You can use white tequila, you can use an Añejo if you prefer it, either one's fine. Um, in a situation like this with the flavors in here, you don't have to use a super premium tequila unless you're just a really a tequila connoisseur and you like a certain one. So we got the tequila going on and then we're gonna use our triple sec or Cointreau, any kind of an orange liqueur will work just fine for this. On this one, we only wanna double it to two ounces. Pop that in there. Triple sec or uh, Quancho is super versatile for all different kinds of cocktails, so it's kind of a nice thing to have around. All right, then we're gonna do our lime juice and our simple syrup. So for the lime juice, we're cheating today because I'm all about kitchen hacks and saving time. And we are gonna use pure lime juice. You don't want the stuff that's from concentrate. That doesn't taste the same and it's not near as good, but if you can find a good pure lime juice that's already squeezed, I say make life a lot faster than sitting here and pressing limes. And then lastly, we're gonna add in our simple syrup. Now I, whoopsie, I don't like this to be real sweet, as I mentioned. So I am just gonna put in actually just about two squirts. So I didn't measure that. Ask my husband, he knows I don't like to measure anything in the kitchen because it just takes the fun out of it. All right, so we've got all of our ingredients in here. We're gonna give it a good shake. And because we're serving this drink, up instead of on the rocks. You wanna make sure and get it super, super frothy and cold. 
So that's the key. If your ice has been sitting out for a while, drain the water off of it, add some new ice, get it really, really, really cold. It's gonna taste better and it's gonna look better. So once that's nice and shaken up, I'd probably shake it a little bit longer, but it's probably boring for you to watch that. So we're gonna go ahead and get this ready to go. And we're gonna pour this right into our glasses. And depending on the juice that you start with, you're gonna find in some cases that it's gonna look a little more red. When I used a different juice and made this previously, it came out a little bit darker. This one's a little bit more on the pinky light side. That's okay. And since it's not quite Thanksgiving-y time or Christmas time, we couldn't find any fresh cranberries. But what I like to do is take and float a couple of fresh cranberries in there. And you can even garnish it with a lime if you like. And a little bit of rosemary. And if you can get fresh cranberries, get frozen ones and pop them in there frozen or take a bag of fresh ones and freeze it. Because what that'll do is it'll actually help keep your cocktail that much cooler when you're drinking it. So some frozen cranberries, if you've got them, would be delicious in there. And you have a wonderful, tasty, and festive cocktail to enjoy with your friends and family. I hope you like the cranberry margarita with the chili salt rim as much as I enjoy it. got the new Colin Mason everyday style mill set. These are both ceramic mechanisms, very lightweight. They are made of acrylic, so they are good for maybe your picnic basket or outdoor entertaining, somewhere you want something that's a little more durable. And they both feature the adjustment nut on the very top, so that'll get you uh, from fine to coarse by turning here. We think these are super cute. They're a little shorter in stature than some of the mills, so they're really, really nice if you wanna you know, take them over to your table as well as maybe you have them in your food prep area. So this is the Everyday Style, which happens to be one of the most popular mills in our lineup worldwide. Interesting factoid there. And then we also have the Darlingtons. These are a shaker set, so not a mill set, but a shaker set, and they are glass. Really nice, cute little style. Again, these could be used in a variety of different places if you just wanna have a quick shake of salt and pepper and maybe a, you, you don't wanna be able to do the grinding. This is a good solution for that. We don't do a lot of just plain shaker sets. So that is the new Darlington style. So the everyday style and the Darlington shaker set, two great new additions to the Cole and Mason product lineup. got the new Xylus wood fiber chopping and cutting boards. What I love about these boards is they carry the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council logo, which means they are made from sustainably harvested wood. They are a part recycled wood product as well, and they are just a real good workhorse to have in any kitchen. You can never have enough cutting boards in your kitchen. You've got friends over helping you do food prep. Maybe the kids are in the kitchen too. You can set up multiple workstations. Having the right cutting boards is a wonderful tool. These are nice in that they have the juice rail that runs all the way around on all three sizes. So we do a small, 
a medium, and a large board all have the juice rail that runs around the entire perimeter, which is super. So if you've got a, maybe a juicy roast or you've got tomatoes, things that have a lot of juice that's coming off or weeping, this will collect that so it doesn't end up all over your cabinet and go down into your drawer and make a big mess. We've all done that before. They have the really, really nice silicone corners on all four corners. And what I like here is that they go to both sides. So it's not just on the top side, also on the back side, all of those corners go through, which allows you to use this board on either side in your kitchen and not have to worry about it sliding around on you while you're cutting. We've all used a sliding cutting board that's slippery on the bottom. Very, very dangerous when you're cutting. So I really like that these stay put when you put them down on the countertop. The handle makes them really, really easy to transport. They're also bacteria resistant by the nature of this wood fiber product. So that's always a plus whenever you're messing around with raw meats and things in the kitchen. But just a really, really nice addition to any kitchen. And again, we have the three sizes. You see me holding the large size. We have the small and we also have the medium boards. So these are the Xylus wood fiber chopping boards available in three different sizes. And also what's nice is that when you go to clean these, we recommend hand washing. They could go in the dishwasher, but we do recommend hand washing for longest you know, wear and, and better performance. But they um, are not, they're not gonna show all the stains that you oftentimes get on boards. So they'll look a lot better longer than some of the white boards that get stained that's really hard to remove. The Xylus boards are also heat resistant to 350 degrees. So if you're pulling a hot dish out of the oven or working with a hot item, they will be fine up to 350. So you could use it as a trivet or possibly use it as a serving tool on your island or on your kitchen table. Just another reason why these boards are a, a workhorse in your kitchen. Let's take a look at the new Cole and Mason Stad Hampton Chili and Spice Mill. I love this guy because we all know Cole and Mason makes amazing salt and pepper grinders, but maybe you have something other than salt and pepper that you want to grind fresh as opposed to buying it store-bought where it's not as pungent, doesn't give as much flavor. Well, here's a great application for this mill. So let's take a peek at the anatomy of this guy. Here you've got a really, really nice large capacity chamber here that you can easily fill with whatever spice you want to grind. So the top just pops off, much like our Derwent Mills and many of the others, and you can easily fill that. And then the top pops right back on. So that's super simple. You've got a ceramic grind mechanism. And what that means is you can do your spices, but you can also do salts in this too. So we're gonna show it in a minute with one of our uh, new salt blends that will work just fine in here. And the way this is marked on the bottom, it's you turn it to adjust, like many of our mills. It's marked lock and unlock. Lock is going to uh, be a very tight. This, uh, if you move this towards the lock, you're going to get a really, really fine grind. If you move it towards the unlock, you're going to get a really, really coarse grind. So you can feel the difference as you're turning this. I've got it set right now towards the locked position, which is going to be very tight. And the reason for that is I've got coriander in here that I want to be really, really finely ground. So this mill does a nice job of very evenly grinding that fresh coriander, which is gonna give you such a better smell and output, and of course, a lot more flavor in your finished product. You could also use the little Pekin chilies that we have here. Those will work really, really nicely in this grinder and get nice and fine, because you don't want big flakes of chili in a lot of your finished dishes. And then we can take our new aromatic chili salt blend in this mill the same way. And I've got it set again fairly fine. And you can see what that looks like. This is great for rimming a cocktail, maybe one of your spicy margaritas. This would be awesome in an Asian dish. Really give it a nice little kick of flavor, but you can see how nice and fine that gets. So it's gonna be a really great output. Lots of different things you can use in this mill. You wanna stick with dried herbs, not anything that's fresh or wet. And you're gonna have great results using the new Stadhampton from Colin Mason. 
We love this mill. Let's, let's us really expand beyond salt and pepper. We hope you'll enjoy using it in the kitchen too. one of our newest products from Cole and Mason called the Ashton Mesa Luna. You may be wondering what in the heck Mesa Luna means. Mesa Luna simply means in Italian half moon. And you can see as you look at this blade here that it looks like a half moon shape with a couple of handles on it. And these are fixed handles for safety and control reasons. And a lot of people like to use a Mesa Luna for cutting instead of your cutting board and your chef's knife. A lot of folks will use this because it is a more self-contained way of cutting where everything is gonna be on your acacia wood cutting surface here. And then your blade is gonna be rocking back and forth. So you're not chasing food over the uh, expanse of a cutting board. Everything's in one nice small place. So I'll give you a little example here of how this guy works and what it's good for. I'm gonna show it with some Italian parsley, but it would be great to use for nuts if you're trying to chop up a bunch of pine nuts maybe or walnuts and also nice for things like garlic because everything will be in that one spot. We've all had uh, cutting issues where you've got your food on the board, especially with nuts, and they're flying all over the cutting board and you can't corral them to get them all uniformly cut. Well, this makes that a little bit easier. So just take, in this case, I'm gonna uh, remove the stems off the parsley, which I did a little bit already. Put that down there. Make sure it's dry, as when you're cutting all herbs, you want them to be dry. If these were washed and still wet, they would just clump together and you wouldn't get even uh, cutting and they'd be really hard to work with and also hard to measure if you're gonna measure. I don't like to measure much, so I don't worry about that part, but it's really hard to work with them. So you're gonna take your blade, holding it in both hands here, and it's just a simple rocking back and forth motion as you move around within your curved cutting surface here on this acacia board. So super, super easy. Just work your food back and forth. If it gets out of hand, just corral it, move it back in towards where you need to work. And very, very quick and easily, you can do coarse chop, fine chop. You can get this exactly the way you want it. Super simple, and notice I am not chasing my food around on the board. There you have your nice Italian parsley. I did a rough chop on this, but you could continue on and get it super fine if that's what you were looking for. So the Ashton Mesa Luna, super simple, very beautiful product, something that a lot of people like to leave out on their counter just because it is attractive, but also very, very functional. And then if you're ready to take this parsley over to your stovetop or to a casserole dish or what have you for garnish, you have everything that you need right here, ready to go and very easy to transport back and forth. I really like this product. I think it's a time saver in the kitchen. And also you can sharpen this blade with a manual handheld pull through type of a sharpener should it ever get dull and you need to do that. So great item, super fun, very attractive, makes a super gift. Thanks for letting me share the Cole and Mason Ashton Mesa Luna with you. I'm really excited to share with you now a recipe that features a Mesa Luna. Now I gotta tell you, when we first added this to the assortment, I was a little nervous. I never really used a Mesa Luna before. But after doing a little bit of research and playing with it with recipes like this, I've come to appreciate what a great tool it is. It's easy to use. It's really quick. If you're someone who's intimidated by knives, it's a super, super safe alternative. Now let's get to our recipe. We're going to make a Thai chicken and a peanut flatbread. So first we're going to start with our flatbread. By the way, all the ingredients we're going to use today are bought pre-packaged. All we have to do is assemble and bake this. This could not be a simpler recipe. So first thing we're gonna do is take some peanut sauce. You can find this in any grocery store. We're gonna take a little peanut sauce, we're gonna cover this. Swirl it around a little bit with a spoon. 
Then on top of this, we're going to take some shredded mozzarella cheese, cover our flatbread with it. Again, pre-purchased in the dairy, super easy so far, right? Now we're going to add some chicken. This is chicken from a rotisserie chicken. You can find it in almost any grocery store now, already pre-cut and pre-shredded. So I'm going to add that here. Now, I'm going to add some shredded carrots. Again, easy to find in the produce area. This is going to give our final dish a little bit of crunch. And now we're going to add some green onions. These have a little bit of kick, so we get crunch. Here we're going to get a little bit of punch. So I'm going to spread my green onions out. Now, I'm going to add a little bit more of my shredded mozzarella cheese to the top of this. Now, I know a lot of people might be thinking with pizza, this isn't usually what you do. But I do like to do this because as this cheese melts, it kind of seals all the vegetables and the chicken together and makes it super easy to cut. All right. Now, the last thing I'm going to add is I'm going to top this with a few crushed peanuts. All right. Now, you might remember from one of our earlier videos how great we said the pizza tray was. Here's a great chance to use that pizza tray. So I'm going to take my flatbread, take, put it here. I'm going to pop it in a 350 degree oven to allow the cheese to melt. Now, thanks to videos, I've already done that. Here's one that I made earlier today. Cheese is already melted. Now, I know you might be saying, wait a minute, Matt. You said this was a mezzaluna recipe. You haven't used it quite yet. Now, we're going to finish this. The first thing we're going to do is take a little bit of peanut sauce. We'll get ready for, to use this. We're going to spread a little more peanut sauce on here just because it's so delicious. Now, we're going to use our mezzaluna. Move this over. This is cilantro. So I'm just going to start my easy rocking motion with my mezzaluna. Cut this up. I was recently showing someone some knife skills. And uh, when it came to mincing, this person was really, really intimidated by it. They didn't like the idea of putting their fingers near the tip of the knife. Even though we were using a Comfort Pro that has that point, that little divot where you put your hands for mincing, they still weren't too comfortable. At that point, I pulled out the mezzaluna. She used this for mincing, and she was happy as could be. OK, there we go. So now to finish our flatbread, we're going to take a little bit of our cilantro. We're going to cover the top of it. And I'm going to use the Stadhampton. We have some chilies in here. I'm going to grind some chilies on top to give it just a little extra punch. And now we're going to plate it. Let me just take my knife couple nice cuts. To me, this is a great, great dish. If you're going to a party and you want to bring an appetizer, that's a little bit different. Or if you have movie night, this is a great alternative to pizza. So here we go. Thai chicken and peanut flatbread. I hope you'll give this a try at home and that you and your family enjoy this as much as I do. Thank you. I'm very excited to show you another use for our mezzaluna. We're gonna make a super classic Italian condiment called gremulata. Now gremulata by itself is a really easy recipe. There's only three ingredients to it. It's parsley, lemon zest, and a little bit of garlic. Put these three things together, come, and kind of like the beetles, they're so much more powerful together than they are separate. So let's make it. So here in my mezzaluna, I have about three quarters of a bunch of parsley. On top of that, I'm gonna add the zest of one lemon. Now here, I have some garlic. I just gave it a real rough chop. At this point, all we have to do is use our mezzaluna and start cutting it together. 
This is super effective because the three ingredients themselves are so powerful. We get a real bunch, uh, punch of freshness from the parsley. We get the brightness from the lemon zest. And of course, there's a real powerful punch that we get from the garlic. Now, if this kind of recipe works for you, one of the other things I like to make with my mezzaluna is uh, taking rosemary and garlic and then working that into like uh, red potatoes that I might be boiling or baking. I do this with that and I just pour it over the top of my roasted red potatoes. And I get great, great flavor. Now, we're about the consistency that I want. So, we're just about done. Now, I want to season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. So, a little bit of crushed sea salt, a little bit of pepper. As I was saying, this is a super, super versatile uh, topping. It can take any kind of bland dish and give it a whole new life. So, for this coming holiday season, when Thanksgiving rolls around, I'm going to take my carrots. I'm going to top it with a little bit of gremolata. It's going to take these ordinary carrots, take the flavor to a whole new level. So as you can see, gremolata, super easy to make, packs a powerful punch to any dish. I hope you use your mezzaluna, you try this at home, and it makes your holiday dishes even better. Well, I think we've got a pretty impressive uh, assortment of goodies that we've made here today, sharing all the wonderful new products, how you can utilize them, tips and techniques on how to sell them and make it a little bit more fun. I'm ready to, uh, to toast this day here pretty shortly. How about you? Absolutely. I hope that you all enjoyed our session today. I hope that also you remember all the things that make Cole & Mason such a great iconic brand. It's 100 years old, ingenuity, great mechanisms, beautiful designs. It's a really, really great brand. And don't forget the updated packaging now that everything's uniform and looks really sharp with its name on pack and ready to go. It's all Absolutely. for sale. Cole and Mason, better than ever. Absolutely. Nicole? Let's toast to a wonderful time and hopefully everyone has an awesome holiday season and gets to utilize a lot of these new products. And we want to thank our friends at the Joyful Gourmet again. They yes. were terrific hosts and we really appreciate their cooperation. Nicole? It's been fun. You too. Cheers, Matt. Congratulations.